Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. In 2013, a rare September storm swept across the plains of Colorado. When it hit the Rockies, it dropped more than a foot of rain in places like Boulder, as much as the city sees in an entire year. The rain unleashed deadly floods and landslides that swept away roads and buildings. In fact, a new study found that a century's worth of erosion and sedimentation took place in a matter of a few days. Once the flooding started, it happened quickly and took a lot of people, you know, unawares. Sarah Rathburn, a geoscientist at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, who experienced the storm herself. On top of the damage to man-made structures, Rathburn knew that the floods moved huge amounts of sediment, wood, and the organic carbon they contain. She saw a unique opportunity to put hard numbers on what went where. At the base of one of the watersheds that flooded, a reservoir captured everything that flowed downhill. I was thinking about being able to track the sediment from the source to what I'm calling this anthropogenic sink, the reservoir, and really quantify it. We don't have a lot of controls on absolutely capturing everything that these large storms produce. And so the fact that the reservoir was capturing everything really seemed like a unique opportunity. So Rathburn and her colleagues got a rapid response research grant from the National Science Foundation to study what happened. The team compared detailed maps of the landscape and the lake bed before and after the storm. Then they quantified the difference. They found that half a million cubic meters of sediment washed downstream during the storm, a volume that would normally take up to 115 years to erode. About 60% of it accumulated in the reservoir, taking up 2% of its storage space. The rest of the material was deposited partway down the catchment, where it will continue to trickle into the reservoir for years to come, Rathburn says. That will cause ongoing headaches for dam managers, who are also worried about large logs clogging the openings that they use to release water. The findings are in the journal Geology. The storm was an extreme event, but Rathburn says such episodes are becoming more and more common. I really do think it's climate change driven and that it's something that is just absolutely worthy and necessary of our study and our investigation. It's it's too, too risky to ignore, given um, what it means for people living in places where hazards occur, which is almost everywhere. <laughs> Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Julia Rosen. Picture a prehistoric human encampment in a cave. What do you see? Maybe some animal hides, bones from last night's dinner, a small fire. But what you might not picture are the other cave dwellers, like bats and the bugs that suck their blood. The bed bugs that we all know and love from hotel rooms and apartments and all that were originally bat parasites. Martin Adams is an archaeoentomologist with Paleo Insect Research. It's a private business in Portland, Oregon. Adams and his colleague Dennis Jenkins analyzed the remains of bedbug cousins, recovered from one of those prehistoric camps, the Paisley Caves in eastern Oregon. And they pinned the insects to three different species within the Simix genus, the same genus as bedbugs. Now, these bugs are bat parasites, not the species that commonly bite humans. But they ranged from 5,100 to 11,000 years old, making them the oldest example of blood-sucking bedbug relatives cohabitating with humans. The study's in the Journal of Medical Entomology. As to whether the cave-dwelling humans were as paranoid as modern humans about the infestation? The humans living in Paisley Caves probably knew that there were bats living in the caves. I sincerely doubt that they knew that that there were bat bugs um, infesting the bats. But make no mistake, bat bugs will still suck human blood if need be, which may in fact be the origin of the modern hotel pests. So don't let the bed bugs bite, or the bat bugs either. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. We tend to see house cats as aloof and independent, mostly preferring to engage in their own kitty business. But that assumption may be littered with error. Because a new study finds that given a choice, Fluffy would probably pick you over her favorite toy or treat. The research, which might give cat owners pause, occurs in the journal Behavioral Processes. Scientists have analyzed what dogs like, and cotton-top tamarins, Galapagos tortoises, even giant pandas. But Kristen Vitali-Shreve, a grad student at Oregon State University, 
realized that no one had ever really put feline predilections to the test. So Shreve and her team got 25 house cats and 25 shelter cats and stuck each in a room with a set of several items. In the first round of tests, kitties got to spend time with objects in four different categories. <coughs> Toys, like a feather or a stuffed mouse. Odors, like a cloth that smells of catnip or a gerbil. Food, like tuna or chicken. And a human, who would pet them or talk to them or play with them. In the final round, the top item from each category would be pitted head-to-head, to head-to-head, for the title of Kitty's Most Favorite Thing. The results? Our take-home message is that although each cat displays an individual preference for each item, Kristen Vitali Shreve, the majority of pet and shelter cats preferred social interaction with the human, followed next by food, then toys, then scent. Fully half the cats preferred spending time with people, although Tuna did come in a close second. And six of the 50 test kitties chose to keep it finicky by refusing to interact with anything or anyone at all. The results suggest that if you ever want to persuade your feline friend, you might offer your attention as a reward. This research is relevant, especially in an applied setting, where preference tests like these could be used to assess an individual's most preferred item, and then that item could be used for training purposes or even to serve as enrichment, um, especially for shelter cats or potentially other captive wildcats to reduce negative behaviors or even stereotypic behaviors. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific Americans, 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. By now you may have heard about a study that came out a couple of weeks ago about spiders. The study got a lot of attention because coverage of the research often focused on the idea that spiders could eat every single person on the planet in a year and still find room for a lot of cows and elephants and such. In other words, spiders need a lot of meat. Fortunately, the food of choice for the overwhelming majority of spiders is other arthropods, mostly insects and another type of tiny critter called springtails. Anyway, the study, which never mentioned spiders eating all the world's people, was done by Martin Neifeler at the University of Basel in Switzerland and Klaus Berghofer of Lund University and Germany's Brandenburg University of Technology, places with plenty of spiders because most places are places with plenty of spiders. The write-up in the April issue of the journal The Science of Nature concluded that the world's spider population weighs some 25 million tons. Now, your average spider only weighs uh, an itty bit, so if you do the calculation, you get a total worldwide population of some 11 gazillion spiders, more or less. But the 25 million tons of spiders is a real number derived from other published studies dating as far back as 1951. The researchers then estimated how much weight in food that much weight of spiders would need, and they also went through many other studies that had estimated how much spiders ate in particular habitats, ranging from tropical forests to farms. Once they crunched all those arthropods, the intrepid spider speculators reached their verdict. Spiders snatch between 400 million and 800 million tons of meat annually. So if you see a spider, and there's almost certainly a bunch in your home right now, you could stomp it, or you could gently put it outside, or you could wish it bon appetit and leave it to dine on the other stuff you probably want in your home even less. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. (laughs) 